Here we are in Shlach Lacha, in the wilderness. It's a very uncertain time, and the, the Israelites are quite nervous. So God sends a dozen leaders from every different tribe to scout out the land of Israel and bring back first-hand accounts of the situation on the ground. Ten of them come back despairing. They said, the land is flowing with milk and honey, and the grapes are so big that the, a single cluster has to be carried by two people on a frame on their shoulders. But, they said, the people are like giants, and we look like grasshoppers. The warriors are feast, fierce, and the walls are so big and fortified. There is no way we can go in there and overcome them. Well, the Israelites hear this report and respond with weeping and crying and hysterical calls to go back to Egypt. But two scouts, Caleb and Joshua, feel differently. Caleb hushed the people and said simply, by all means, we should go. The land is fertile and beautiful. And yes, the people are giants. But after all that God has done for us, already bringing us out of Egypt, giving us manna in the desert, have a little faith. Well, over the last several weeks, American Jews have felt a little also in the wilderness. We've been upset and confused and at sea at how to understand the recent violence in Israel, the rise of anti-Semitic violence in its wake. And last week, on 48 hours notice, UJA Federation of New York helped send almost two dozen rabbis from all the different tribes, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, to scout out the land of Israel and to bring back our first-hand accounts of the situation on the ground. We all, all 22 of us, heard the same people, saw the same events, the same cities, but like the scouts, we all came back with very different conclusions. I read their social media posts and just listened to what they said, and it was interesting how we all felt it differently. Last night, at a UJA panel, beautifully moderated by our own Abby Pogerbin, the five Manhattan rabbis from the trip shared our reflections together. And one of my colleagues, who I know to be an outspoken, passionate Zionist, shared as his final thought that he could not find anything hopeful to say after our trip. He said he saw the facts on the ground, the broken trust. He could not find a way forward. I'll admit I could relate to his assessment. This was the darkest, hardest trip I've ever taken to Israel. Do I disclose all the heartbreak I saw? Do I confess the despair I was feeling when I was there? And then I opened up the Torah portion this week, and I honestly felt like it was giving me tochacha. That's the Hebrew word for rebuke. It was a very on-the-nose message of how I'm supposed to tell you about my trip from Israel. Because in case you're wondering how God felt about the way the 12 spies reported their view and their report of Israel, you should know that God punishes the 10 despondent spies very harshly, along with all of their followers, announcing that they will not get to go into the Promised Land. But Caleb and Joshua... Who, see God, who God sees as imbued with a different spirit, who are able to see past all the roadblocks and all the challenges, are rewarded and praised. Now, I'm not saying that I think this portion suggests that we whitewash or ignore the giants that stand in the way of Israel's peaceful future. Those roadblocks are very real. But I think this portion is challenging us to see them in light of the larger context of everything that Israel has already been through and that the Jewish people have overcome already. And that is the report I'm going to try to give you in brief. I want to tell you about the conversation we had with Mohammed Darwashi, who is an Israeli Arab who works for decades in the area of shared society for Israeli Arabs and Jews. And he expressed such despair 
as he saw the fragile trust he has been building for years evaporate in a week of violence. He said, if you leave this country feeling hopeful, then you haven't been listening carefully enough. But I must share that in the next breath, as a response to the question of now what, he said, well, now what we have to do is just increase the magnitude of the work because those who have been involved in this shared society work, they were the ones de-escalating the violence. Despite himself, he has not given up. I want to tell you the story of kibbutz near Oz, which is a mostly abandoned kibbutz on the Gaza border. After years of attacks from Hamas rockets across the border, almost all the residents of the kibbutz have left. The remaining residents of near Oz are now in their 80s. They remain because they are stubborn kibbutzniks and because many of them honestly have nowhere else to go. But I also must tell you about Emily, who was born in Austria and made Aliyah to Israel and was a lone soldier in the IDF and is now part of an intentional community of students who applied through an organization called Kedma to live on kibbutz near Oz. Emily and others in her group have committed to living in this outpost to volunteer 300 hours a year of service to the community, mostly assisting the elderly residents. And she's not just alone with these 30. There are 15 of these communities all along these marginalized borders that have been abandoned. When you hear Emily and these idealistic Israelis describe how they have adopted new Sabas and Saftas, which are grandparents, from this kibbutz, and have found such deep community and a sense of purpose, I knew that this was the seed of a new kibbutz movement, and I left inspired. I could tell you the story of Fatan, an Israeli Arab woman, and Dror, her Jewish-Israeli partner in the Arab and Jewish community center in Lod. This is a mixed city outside of Tel Aviv, and the community center has already struggled to get its Jewish and Arab citizens to actually do activities together in this community center. But then the violence erupted in the streets. And Fatin shared with tears in her eyes the horror and the helplessness she felt watching some of her Arab neighbors set Jewish cars on fire, Jewish homes on fire. The utter fear she felt when she saw Jewish neighbors stone her own son. Friends have told her, shut the community center down. We need to leave. But she said, I know my neighbors, the Arab ones and the Jewish ones. And once you know people, you cannot unknow them or stop caring about them. I am still here and I'm going to stay. And I must tell you about Yuval from Totseret Haaretz. He moved to Lod to help this somewhat marginalized mixed city become a model of what a shared society in Israel could look like. He's a part of a larger coalition of 280 intentional communities like this with thousands of young Israelis and young families who connect in groups of 15 to 50, settling in communities that need them. They volunteer in the schools, they get civically involved, they clean up parks, they build relationships across lines of secular and religious, working class and professional, Jewish and Arab. Yuval spoke about how he spent all last week sitting Shiva for his city. He said, I actually cried over a city. But he said, now I have to rise up. I don't have the luxury of giving up. He said, for my grandfather, who was an early pioneer, Zionism was about draining the swamps. For my generation, the new Zionism is taking marginalized cities and making them central, making a mixed city, not a model of violence and failure, but the best of what Israel can be. There is so much more that I saw even in my short 48 hours on the ground and I wish I had more time. But in this snapshot, I hoped and aspired to give you a bit of a report from the land of Israel that was a little bit more like the one that Caleb and Joshua would share. One that acknowledges the many incredible hard challenges 
but puts it in the context of the miraculous grit and resiliency of the Jewish people and the people of Israel. One final note, when we were in Israel last week, several of the people we spoke to lamented that after four elections and two years of a non-functioning government, they were so upset that it seemed that not only did the violence shatter a lot of trust, but it killed a possible coalition that could bring a new leadership to Israel. But it wasn't killed. Just days ago, Naftali Bennett of the right-wing Yamina party and Yair Lapid of the center-left Yesh Atid party announced that they had managed to still put together this historic coalition of eight incredibly diverse parties across the spectrum, including an Arab bloc for the first time in Israel's history. Now, you might hear this news and receive it, like I've seen in some news reports already, like the 10 despondent spies, with a lot of cynicism. This is never going to work. The only thing that brings those groups together is their hatred for Netanyahu. Or, we can interpret this miraculous announcement, as Caleb and Joshua might, with a little bit of awe and some hope that leaders from every cross-section of Israeli society have put aside their egos and their political grievances for something bigger than themselves. For once, maybe the impossible could be possible. Shlach Lecha is perhaps the first place we learn that Zionism is an act of radical optimism. It reminds us of how deeply important leadership is in moments of challenge. I hope that we all can remember that the mindset that we bring has a very real impact on what we are able to dream up and accomplish.